الحمد للہ وسلاۃ وسلام الرسول اللہ وعلیٰ علی وصاب اجمعین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم کن تم خیرا امت نخرجت الناس تمرون بالمعروف و تنہ المنکر و تمن نہ بلّہ کل انکانہ آباؤکم و ابناؤکم و اخوان کم و ازواج کم و عشرت کم و ام و الق طرف تم موہا و تدار تکشونا کسا دہا و مساکن ترزون احبا علیکم من اللہ و رسول ہی و جہاد انفی سبیل ہی فتربسو حتا یا تی اللہ بمری و اللہ الادم الفاسقین ربش علی صدری و یسلی عمری واہل العقد تمسان یف کے اکاولی مائی رسپیکٹ ایلڈرس اینڈ مائی ڈیبر اینڈ سسٹرس آئی ویلکم آل آف یو ود اسلامک گریٹنگز السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ میں پیس مرسی اینڈ بلیسنگز آف اللہ سبحانہ و تعالی آف آل مائی ٹی گاڈ بی آن آل آف یو اٹس این آنر فار می ٹو بی انوائٹیڈ فار دا تھرڈ ٹائم بائی دا دبئی انٹرنیشنل ہولی قرآن اوارڈ آرگنائز بائی دا دبئی گورنمنٹ انڈر دا پیٹرنج آف شیخ محمد راشد المختوم دا وائس پریسیڈنٹ اینڈ پرائم منسٹر آف یو اے اینڈ دا رول آف دبئی اینڈ اٹس اے پلیجر فار می ٹو ایڈریس دی آڈینس آف دبئی آفٹر اے گیپ آف فور ایئرس اینڈ آئی ریمبر دا لاسٹ ایڈ ایڈریس دی آڈینس آف دبئی واز ان ٹو تھاؤزینڈ اینڈ فائیو رمضان اگین آرگنائز بائی دا دبئی انٹرنیشنل ہولی قرآن اوارڈ اینڈ اٹ واز جسٹ بفور وی لانچڈ آور سیٹلائٹ چینل دیٹ از دا پیس ٹی وی جسٹ اباؤٹ ٹو منتھس بفور وی لانچڈ آور سیٹلائٹ چینل اینڈ الحمد للہ بائی اللہ از گریس دا پیس ٹی وی ان دا اسپین آف تھری اینڈ ہاف ایئرس ہیز بیکم دا موسٹ پاپولر اینڈ دا موسٹ واچڈ اسلامک سیٹلائٹ چینل ان دا ورلڈ ناٹ اونلی not only not only has it become the most watched islamic channel but in the last few months it has become the most popular watched religious channel in the world alhamdulillah and today the estimated viewership of peace tv is alhamdulillah more than 100 million people throughout the world and we'll be happy to know Two months ago, we launched a second channel. Previously in the Peace TV, we had 75% English and 25% Urdu. The people who didn't know English used to complain that why is Urdu so less? And in the Western world, those who didn't understand Urdu, Hindi used to say, what is this in between Urdu and Hindi programs coming? So to satisfy both the people, two months back, we launched a second satellite channel, which is called as the Peace TV Urdu. So I think... that whenever the Dubai International Holy Quran Award calls me, I think it's linked with the launch of a satellite channel. And you'll be happy to know that both these channels are, alhamdulillah, uplinked from the Dubai media city. The uplink from Dubai media city is on the inter side and Arab side covering Asia, Middle East, Africa, Australia. And from London, we uplink and cover Europe and North and South America. So I would like to thank the Dubai Holy Quran Award. for calling me and for even Dubai government for giving the facility for uplinking both these satellite channels. The topic of this evening's talk is Dawa or destruction. What is the meaning of the word Dawa? Those of us, especially people coming from the Indian subcontinent, who speak Hindi and Urdu, they know the meaning of the word Dawat. And the moment we hear the word Dawat, we start thinking of chicken biryani or mutton biryani. <laughs> you know, as we're having a party. Dawa or Dawat actually means an invitation. Dawa means to call. Today, we will not be speaking about an invitation to a lunch or a dinner party. Today we'll be speaking about Dawat al-Islam, an invitation, a call to Islam. 
and an invitation is not given to the own family members. Normally, an invitation is given to an outsider. Similarly, Dawud al-Islam is mainly an invitation, a call to the non-Muslims. Whenever we speak about Islam to a non-Muslim, trying to clarify the misconception, trying to make him understand Islam better, to remove the negative idea that he has about Islam, it is called as Dawa. Many a time, Dawa is also used synonymously when we speak about Islam to a Muslim. But the more appropriate Arabic word, when we speak about Islam to a Muslim, it is Islah. Islah in Arabic means to repair. It means to improve. So when a Muslim speaks to another Muslim, giving him more information about Islam, the more appropriate word is Islah. And when we speak to the non-Muslims, talking about Islam, the more appropriate word is Dawa. So today, we'll be discussing Dawa or destruction. The Muslims should convey the message of Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the non-Muslims, otherwise they will be destroyed. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the Glorious Quran, from Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum khaira ummat nukhrijat lin nas. Oi people, oi Muslims, ye are the best of peoples evolved for mankind. Ye Muslims are the best of peoples evolved for mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us Muslims as the khaira ummah. Allah is giving us that honor. Whenever an honor is given, it is always followed up with a responsibility. There is no honor without responsibility. For example, in a school, the principal has got more honor than a teacher. A teacher has got more honor than a clerk. Similarly, the principal has got more responsibility than a teacher. A teacher has got more responsibility than a clerk. There is no honor without responsibility. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran is calling us Muslim as a khaira ummah. He's calling us as the best of people. Don't you think we have a responsibility? The reply is given in the same verse. Allah continues and says, Because you enjoin what is good and you forbid what is wrong and you believe in Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us Muslim as a khaira ummah because we enjoin what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. If we do not enjoy what is good, and if we do not forbid what is wrong, we aren't fit to be called as Khaira Ummah. We aren't fit to be called as Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this honor, calls us Muslims, the Khaira Ummah, the best of people, because we enjoin what is good, and we forbid what is wrong, and we believe in Allah. If we do not convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the non-Muslims, and remove the misconceptions that is there in their minds, we aren't fit to be called as Khaira Ummah, we aren't fit to be called as Muslims. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 143, that we have made you an Ummah a middlemost community, a justly banished community, so that you may be a witness over the nations, and the messenger will be a witness over you. Allah has made us Muslims as an Ummah Tewast, a middlemost community, a justly banished community, so that we convey the message, we bear witness to the others, to the other people in humanity. And our messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will bear witness over us. In the beginning of my speech, I also quoted a verse of the Quran from Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 24. Surah Tawbah happens to be the most militant surah in the glorious Quran. If you read the Quran, the most militant surah in the complete Quran is Surah Tawbah. Why do I say that Surah Tawbah is the most militant surah in the Quran? Because 
Surah Toba is the only surah in the glorious Quran which does not begin with the beautiful formula Bismillah Rahman Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Every surah, every chapter of the glorious Quran begins with the beautiful formula Bismillah Rahman Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Except Surah Toba, chapter number 9. If you read for a class, chapter number 112. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qul huwa Allah ahad. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Say is Allah one and only. Surah Falak, chapter number 113. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falak. Say I seek refuge with the Lord of dawn. Surah Nas, chapter number 114. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Say, I seek refuge with Allah, who is the Lord of the humankind. Every chapter begins with the beautiful formula, Bismillah and Rahman and Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. But in the beginning of Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, there is no Bismillah. Why? For example, if you are walking down the streets of Dubai, maybe on Dubai Cornish, along with your wife, or along with your mother, and suppose there is a hooligan who snatches the handbag of your wife or of your mother and he runs away. What will you do? But naturally follow. And the moment you catch up with him, you will not say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, may peace be on you. You will not say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. The moment you catch up with him, you will get down the subject directly. Hey, mister, give the handbag, I'll break your neck. Hey, mister, give the handbag, I'll break your arm. You will get down to the subject directly. Bismillah is uncalled for. Similarly, if you read Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, if you read the few verses in the beginning, there was a peace treaty between the Muslims and the Mushriks of Makkah. And this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the Mushriks of Makkah. By the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 5, Surah Tawbah chapter number 9, He is giving a warning. He is giving an ultimatum to the Mushriks of Makkah. You put things straight in four months time, otherwise there is a declaration of war. When Allah is giving an ultimatum, is giving a warning, he gets down to the subject directly. Though there are many reasons why Bismillah is not then Surah Tawbah, but some of the Mufassirin, they say that because Allah is giving a warning directly to the Mushriks of Makkah, Bismillah is uncalled for. He gets down to the subject directly. But by the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 24, now he is addressing us Muslims. Now we Muslims are in the firing line. And Allah says, Kul, say, in kana abaukum, whether it be for your fathers, wa abnaukum, or your sons, wa ikhwanukum, or your brothers, wa azwajukum, or your spouses, your wives or husbands, wa ashiratukum, or your relatives. Allah is asking, what are your considerations? Are they your fathers? Are they your sons? Are they your spouses? Your wives or husbands? Are they your relatives? And Allah continues. Your wealth that you have amassed. The business in which you deal. The houses in which you live. Allah is asking, what are your considerations? Are they your fathers? Are they your sons? Are they your brothers? Are they your spouses? Are they your relatives? The wealth you have amassed? The business in which you deal? The house in which you live? Some people may be worried that, you know, what will my father say? What will my son say? What will my brother say? My spouses or my relatives? There will be a loss in my business. Maybe the wealth I have amassed, I will lose it. The house that I live in, there may be danger to it. And Allah continues. 
ahabba ilaykum min allahi wa rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi if you love all these things more than allah his rasul and doing jihad in the way of allah allah says if you love all these eight things your fathers your sons your brothers your spouses your wives and husbands your relatives the business in which you deal the wealth that you have amassed the house in which you live if you love all these eight things more than allah his messenger his rasul and doing jihad in the way of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah says fa tarabbasu wait hatta yati allah al yamri until allah brings about his decision unto you hatta yati allah al yamri until allah brings about his destruction unto you wallahu la yazrukum al fasikin and allah guides not the fasik people allah is telling in this verse of the quran of surah tauba chapter 9 verse number 24 that if you love your father your sons your brothers your spouses your relatives the wealth you have amassed the business in which you deal the houses in which you live if you love all these eight things more than allah more than his rasul his messenger and doing jihad in the way of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and jihad fi sabli allah is of various types and today the best jihad according to me is conveying the message of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is dawa conveying the message of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the non muslims removing the misconception from their minds if you love all these eight things more than allah his rasul and doing jihad away from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah says wait what does allah mean when he says wait and we muslims are waiting sitting on our backside doing nothing what does allah mean when he says wait for example if in a school there is a senior student who is bullying the junior student and the junior student tells the senior student wait till i get my elder brother and his elder brother happens to be the biggest hooligan in that area when the junior student is telling the senior student wait what is actually telling him is that you buzz off you vanish you better improve otherwise you'll be taught a lesson so sumay allah says for tarabbus wait he's telling us muslims wait wait doesn't mean and we muslims are waiting sitting on our backside doing nothing what does allah mean when he says wait He's telling you, you buzz off. You better improve. Fatarabbasu hatta yati Allahu yamri. Wallahu lazim al fasikin. Wait until Allah brings His destruction unto you, and Allah guides not the fasik people. Imagine Allah is comparing these eight things with the love of Allah, His Rasul, and doing jihad in His way. The first He says is whether it be for your fathers. and you know that in the quran allah subhanahu wa taala after believing in allah the next thing allah says is you have to be kind to your parents allah says in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 23 and 24 that he has ordained for you that you worship none but him and that you be kind to your parents and if one or both of them reach old age don't say a word of contempt don't say uff to them rather address them with honor and speak with them respect and lower to them your wing of humility and pray to the lord that cherish them bless them as they cherished me in childhood now allah is comparing your parents with the beef of parents in terms of love of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your parents your sons your spouses your relatives your brothers and then he says the wealth you have amassed the business in which you deal the house in which you live that means the wealth that ever amassed if you do not spend in the way of allah subhanahu wa taala then allah says wait for tarabbas and allah gives an example a beautiful example in surah baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 261 allah says that if you spend your wealth in the way of allah subhanahu wa taala it is like a grain of corn which grows into 7 years each year bearing 100 grains that means allah says if you sow one grain of corn in the way of allah subhanahu wa taala allah will give you seven spikes seven years each bearing 100 grains 
That means if you give one, Allah will give you 700 times. In business terminology, it is called as 70,000 percent. And I'm talking about business because I know that the world is hit with recession, and especially Dubai. So if you want a business in which you will never lose, it is business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, in these times of turmoil, ups and downs, markets go up, markets come down, the business in which you will never lose is business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah promises you 700 times return, 70,000% return, 70,000. The market in Dubai was good. In one year, you're getting 50% profit, 100% profit, real estate, 200% profit, everyone goes into it. When Allah is telling 70,000% profit, no one is going for Allah's way. Why? We say we believe in Allah. 70,000% Allah promise. And Allah doesn't stop there. He continues. And Allah will give you many fold more. So Allah is comparing all these eight things which you love. Your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your husbands and wives, your relatives, the wealth you have amassed the business in which you deal, the house in which you live. Allah is saying, if you love all these things more than Allah, His Rasul, and doing jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, Fatarabbas to wait, hatta ya'ti Allah bi amri, until Allah brings about His destruction to you. Wallahu ila azul kumil fasikin. And Allah guides not the fasik people. Allah says in Surah Muhammad, chapter number 47, verse number 38, wa inta tawallo, yas tabdil qawman gairakum, summa laikun amsalakum, if you do not do your job, if you turn away from Allah's path, Allah will substitute in your place another people. Summa laikunam salakum, and they will not be like you. Allah tells in the Quran in Surah Muhammad, chapter number 47, verse number 38. But in if you do not do your job, if you turn away from Allah's path, yes, Allah will substitute in your place another people. Summa laikunam salakum, and they will not be like you. And this example we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first chose the Jews to deliver his message. They were the chosen people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they were very proud. They did not follow Allah's commandments. If you read the Quran, more than 75% of the messengers of the prophets mentioned in the Quran, they are Jews. Majority. The Jews, they were the chosen people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they did not follow Allah's commandments. Allah gives the example in Surah Juma, chapter number 62, verse number 5, that the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Mosaic law was given to the Jews. But they did not do the obligations. Their example, their similitude is that like donkeys. On whose back is tomes, tons of books, and they understand it not. The Jews were the chosen people. But they did not follow the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They did not follow the message. So Allah gives the similitude that they are like donkeys on whose backs is tomes, tons of books, and they understand it not. And the same message is given in the Bible. If you read the Bible in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 21, verse number 43, it says that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to those nations who shall bear fruit of it. That means if you do not follow Allah's commandments, if you do not follow the commandment of God, in Gospel of Matthew chapter 21 verse 43, it says that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the nation who shall bear fruit thereof. And we have these examples. The Jews, they were proud. They said we were the chosen people. And Allah has his own way. If you do not follow Allah's commandments, what he does, the people you look down upon he brings them from the dirt and makes them to sit on your head. And the Jews, they looked down upon the Arabs. 14 years back, the Arabs were looked down upon the Jews. And those days, it was called as Jamil Jahiliya, the days of the ignorance. The Arabs were the ignorant people that time. And they were so ignorant that they did the tawaf around the Kaaba naked. They had a philosophy. How can we present ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better than the way we came in this world. So they did the tawaf around the Kaaba naked. They were that ignorant. What does Allah do? If you do not follow His commandment, 
Allah will substitute the place and the people. Summa laikunam salakum, and they will not be like you. So Allah brings these Arabs, and through the revelation of the glorious Quran, He makes these Arabs, who were called the most ignorant people, as the torchbearers of the world. He makes the people you look down upon to sit on your head. And we find that after the revelation of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the Arabs as the most enlightened people. But we should not be proud like the Jews. If we start being proud like the Jews, Allah says, Yes, summa laikunam salakum. If you do not do your job, if you do not follow the commandment, Allah will substitute in your place another people. Summa laikunam salakum, and they will not be like you. And we have the example in Spain. We Muslims, we rule Spain for about 800 years. But we did not convey the message. We did not give dawah. What does Allah do? Allah wipes out the Muslims. There was not a single Muslim who could openly give the Azan in Spain. The Crusaders came and they wiped out the Muslims. We did not do the job. We didn't convey a message. So now Allah is giving us a warning. And we see the ups and downs in history. That if you do not do the job, if you do not convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah is giving us hidayah to the non-Muslims, Allah will substitute in your place another people, summa laikunam salakum, and they will not be like you. MashaAllah. Whenever you ask this question, and I like to ask this question to the Muslims here, that who do you love the most in this world? Who do you love the most in this world? Allah, mashallah. 100% correct, there is no price for that. Simple question, simple answer. When you ask any Muslim, who do you love the most, his answer would be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You ask any Muslim from any part of the world, who do you love the most, his answer would be Allah. Do we love Allah more than our mother? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes, mashallah. Do you love Allah more than your father? Yes. Do you love Allah more than your sons? Yes. Do you love Allah more than your wife? More than your husband? More than your husband? You ask any Muslim, and the answer would be the same. We love Allah the most in the world. We love Allah more than our mother, more than our father, more than our sons, more than our wives, more than our husband. The answer is the same. We say it, Wallah. But do we actually mean it? I'd like to ask you a simple question again. That suppose, one day in the morning, you leave your house and go to office for work. And when you're away from home, your neighbor, he abuses your mother. He uses foul language against your mother. When you come back home, and when you come to know that your neighbor has abused your mother, verbal abuse, has used foul language against your mother what will you do what will you do what will you do Banjim. what will you do kill him mashallah one person wants to punch him one person wants to hit him one person wants to kill him See, I do agree, we love our mother. If anyone abuses a mother unnecessarily, without any rhyme or reason, uses foul language against a mother, I do agree, someone would like to hit him, someone would like to punch him, someone would like to kill him. It is human nature. Why? Because we love our mother. How dare someone abuses my mother? And believe me, if you cannot do it yourself, what will you do? You will hire someone else to do the job, but you will teach him a lesson, yes or no? Yes. Why? Because we love our mother. If someone abuses our mother, he uses foul language against your mother. You will teach him a lesson. Either you'll punch him or you'll hit him. If you cannot do it yourself, you will hire someone else to do the job, but you'll teach him a lesson. Yes or no? Yes, mashallah. Why? Because we love our mother. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maryam, chapter number 19, verse number 88 to 90, Allah says, They say, 
that Allah most gracious has begotten a son. Lakad jitum shayyan idda. Indeed, they have put forth a thing most monstrous. If anyone says that Allah has begotten a son, it is the biggest abuse you can give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is crying in the Quran that if anyone says Allah has begotten a son, it is the most heinous sin you can do. If the sky had feelings, the sky would have burst open. The earth would have split open. And the mountains would have fallen down to utter ruin. Allah says that if the sky had feelings, and if someone would have said that Allah has begotten a son, the sky would have burst open. The earth would have split open. And the mountains would have fallen to utter ruin. But to us Muslims, believe me, it makes no difference. Every day, our non-Muslim friends, our non-Muslim colleagues, our non-Muslim neighbors, they are abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are saying that Allah has begotten a son, and we Muslims, we can't even open our mouth. We say, we love Allah more than our mother, more than our father, more than our wife. We say it, but do we mean it? Every day, you go to school, you go to colleges, you go to universities, you go to place of work, you go to your offices. Every day, our non-Muslim brothers, our Hindu brothers and sisters, our Christian brothers and sisters, they are saying that Allah has begotten a son and we can't even open our mouth. We say we love Allah more than our mothers, more than our fathers. Someone wants to abuse your mother, you want to punch him, you want to hit him, you want to kill him. Every day, our non-Muslim colleagues, our non-Muslim friends, they're abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are saying that Allah has begotten a son and we can't even open our mouth. I'm not telling that you should punch him. I'm not telling that you should hit him. I'm not saying that you should fight him. I'm not saying that you should kill him. At least open your mouth. When you say you love Allah more than your mother, more than your father, someone abuses a mother, you want to hire someone else to do the job. When they're abusing our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't fight them, don't hit them. At least open your mouth. Every day. Leave aside opening our mouth. We're afraid to even talk to them. All of us Muslims know very well. When we go for parties, if you go to a party called by a Hindu friend, and if he's having some puja, or gives a prasad, you know, prasad means the food they give to the deity, to the idol. If they offer to the Muslim, almost all the Muslims know that eating prasad is haram. Why? Allah says in no less than four different places. In Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 173. In Surah Maida chapter number 5, verse number 3. In Surah Anam chapter number 6, verse number 145. And Surah Nahal chapter number 16, verse number 115. Hurramat alaykum ul maitu wa Forbidden for you for food, ah? Dead meat, blood the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken. All of us Muslims know very well that to eat the food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken, it is a sin. But when the Hindus offer you prasad, you feel bad to refuse it. So what do you do? You say Bismillah and have it. Tomorrow, you'll say Bismillah and have alcohol. Day after tomorrow, you'll say Bismillah and have pork. What's happened to the Muslim Ummah? We can't even open our mouth. I'm not telling fight them. At least open your mouth. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, Revile not those, abuse not those who they worship besides Allah, lest in their ignorance, they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot abuse, we cannot criticize, we cannot speak bad about those who they worship. Those things they worship besides Allah, lest in their ignorance, they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not abusing their gods. I'm not insulting, I'm asking a simple question. Who is this God? Simple question and the work is done. I don't have to do PhD in comparative religion. Simple question, who is this God? And the job is done. But we Muslims, we are afraid. You know, if I do dawah with my non-Muslim, I will lose this friendship. We are more interested in keeping friendship with our friend than keeping friendship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happened to the Muslim ummah? And believe me, I speak openly, I keep on traveling. Believe me, my Hindu friends respect me. 
And if happen to come on the airport in the customs, that Hindu custom officer will tell you, Dr. Zakir Naik, Jo Kayanga, Sach Kayanga, Sach Kayanga, Kush Ne Kayanga. Whatever he will say, he will say the truth, but nothing but the truth. This is the oath we take in the, when we go in the court of law. When we want to give a witness in the court of law of India, we say in Hindi, I'm Sach Kayanga, Sach Kayanga, Kush. So he's telling on my behalf that whatever Dr. Zakir Naik will say, will say the truth, nothing but the truth. And they let me pass without checking. Hindu, I'm not doing the house so that they allow me to go, but they respect me more. When I go to the shopkeeper and they Dr. Zakir Naik, good discount. They give me free. <laughs> we Muslims are afraid that if I do dawah, I lose my business. Here, mashallah, I get better discounts. Simple. I'm not doing it for the discount. Please don't get me wrong. I'm doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah helps me. And imagine now what you saw in the introduction the person told me that I'm coming on the channel and mashallah millions of non-Muslims in India alone. Throughout the world there are tens of millions watching our channel non-Muslim mashallah. The popularity has increased. Imagine in a voting of non-Muslim more than 1 billion people in India. More than 1 billion. The non-Muslims included, they voted me. The only religious preacher in the full list of 100 is a Muslim preacher. There is no Hindu preacher. The only religious preacher. There is no Hindu preacher in the full list of 100. There is no Shankaracharya. There is no Christian priest in the full list of 100. The first time any preacher, any religious preacher that came in the top 100 was a Muslim. In a country in which Muslims are minority, less than 20%. Why? Because of Dawah. We Muslims, we don't guide the non-Muslims, leave us at that. We become party to them. For example, now, within a few months, you will have Christmas coming. Now, many of us Muslims, when we meet the Christians, we say, Merry Christmas! Want to increase the friendship. When you are saying Merry Christmas, what are you doing? You are giving Shahada Nauz Billah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has begotten a son on the 25th of December. Leave aside correcting them. When you say Merry Christmas to your Christian friends, you are giving shahada. You are bearing witness that knows Billah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begot a son on the 25th of December. Leave aside correcting them, you are becoming party to them. It is so easy. If it's Christmas time, only thing you have to ask them, that why do you celebrate Christmas? So they'll tell you it is the birthday of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Who is this Jesus Christ, peace be upon him? Oh, Jesus Christ is Almighty God. Immediately, your dawah starts. That there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that he is God or why he says worship me. If any Christian can show me any verse in the Bible, any unequivocal statement, any unnumbering statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, say that he is God or worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity. Simple. Make it a merry day for them. Where is the question of you agreeing? Many of the Christians, they love me. Many of the Christians, they revere me, they respect me. Many non-Muslims, they tell me that after watching Peace TV, we have come to know more about religion than what we learned in the past 40-50 years. They respect me, they love me. Why are you afraid? It is the duty that every Muslim should convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the non-Muslims. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 120, walan tarda, ankal yahudu, walan nasara, hatta tatabiyu millatihum. The Jews and the Christians, they will never be satisfied until you follow their brand of religion. Allah says in the Quran, the Jews and the Christians, they will never be satisfied with the Muslim until you follow their brand of religion, until you become a Jew or a Christian. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 111, Allah says, وَقَالُوا لَيَّتْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُدَرْ نَصَرَ They say, the Jews and Christians, you Muslims, you shall never enter Jannah with all your piety, with all your tawheed, with all your fasting, with all your salah, with a mark on your forehead, with all the hajj, you shall never enter Jannah unless 
you become a Jew or a Christian. The Jews and the Christians, they come and tell us, the Muslims, you Muslims, you shall never enter Jannah with all your piety, with all your fasting, with all your hajj, with your salah, with your tawhid, you shall never enter Jannah until you become a Jew or a Christian. Allah says, Tilk amani juhum. This is the wishful thinking. Bakwas e bakwas. Vain desires. Kul. Tell them. Ha tupunanakum. Produce your proof. In kuntum sadikin. But if you're truthful. Tell them to produce the proof if they're truthful. And these Christian missionaries, they have produced the proof. They have produced the Bible in no less than 2,000 different languages. My Bible says this. My Bible says that. My Bible says this. My Bible says that. What do we have to do? Do we have to follow the Bible hook, line and sinker? Whenever someone shows you his proof, suppose someone shows you his identity card, what do you do? You verify whether it is correct or not. You don't believe in it unless you verify. So if they have shown their proof, their Bible, what do we have to do? We have to verify it. Have we Muslims verified the proof? When Allah says, Kul hatu burhanakum, produce your proof, what does Allah say? Take the proof and believe in it. In kuntum sadikin, but if you're truthful. That means Allah is telling us to verify the proof. These Christian missionaries leave aside verifying their proof. What are they doing? They are using our Burhan, our Quran against us. These Christian missionaries, they are using our Quran against the Muslims. There are hundreds of thousands of Christian missionaries throughout the world, millions of them. They come knocking at the doors of the Muslims and they ask the question, you are a Muslim? I said, yes, we are Muslims. It's mentioned in the Quran that Bible is the word of God and we say, yes, it's mentioned. Then why don't you follow the Bible? We have no reply. That's the next question. That how many times is the name of your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, mentioned in the Quran? If you know, you'll give the reply that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mentioned by name in the Quran five times. Four as Muhammad, one says Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the next question. How many times is the name of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, mentioned in the Quran? If you don't know, they will tell you. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, Isa alayhi salam, is mentioned by name in the Quran 25 times. And if you check up, it is correct. That's the next question. Who is greater? A person who mentioned five times by name in the Quran is greater or a person who mentioned 25 times by name in the Quran is greater? Who's greater? Five or 25? Five or 25? Five. Five is greater than 25. Who's greater? A person who mentioned five times by name in the Quran is greater or a person who's mentioned 25 times by name in the Quran is greater? They ask the question, but they don't give you the reply. They let your mind think. They poison your mind. They come knocking at the doors of the Muslims. That's the next question. Your Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Did he have a mother and father? He said, yes, he had a mother and father. Did Prophet Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, did he have mother and father? He said, no. He had a mother, but he had no father. That's the next question. Who is greater? A person who's born with a mother and father is greater or a person who's born without a father is greater? Who's greater? A person who's born with a mother and father is greater or a person who's born without a father is greater? Who's greater? Who's greater? Person born? Who's greater? They ask the question, but don't give the reply. They let your mind think. They use as Muslims as a punching bag. They use us like domats. And believe me, Muslims can't even answer. That's the next question. Your Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Did he do any miracles? We said, yes, he did many miracles. Did he any time give life to the dead? And we have to agree that no verse of the Quran, no Sai Hadith says that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave life to the dead. That's the next question. Did Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, did he give life to the dead? And we have to agree the Quran says, Be Allah, wake up in the name of Allah. Yes, he gave life to the dead. So who's greater? A person who can give life to the dead is greater or a person who cannot give life to the dead is greater? Who's greater? A person who can give life to the dead is greater or a person who cannot give life to the dead is greater? They ask the question, but they don't give you the reply. They let your mind think. They poison our minds. They ask the next question. Your Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
Is he physically dead or alive? He said, no, physically he's dead. He's buried in Medina. Is Isa alayhi salam dead or alive? We have to agree. That according to the Quran, Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 158, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised up Isa alayhi salam alive. So who's greater? A prophet who's dead is greater or a prophet who's alive is greater? Who's greater? A prophet who's dead is greater or a prophet who's alive is greater? Who's greater? They ask the question, but they don't give you the reply. They let your mind think. They poison your mind. They are using us Muslims like punching bags, like dough mats, and we can't even open our mouth. All these replies are given in the Quran. If you read the Quran with understanding, all these replies are there, easy. All the replies are given. You don't have to be a scholar. You have to read the Quran with understanding. All these answers are given. See, doing dawa is very easy. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64. Kul, yahil kitab. Say, O people of the book, ta'alo ila kalimatin sawa in bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na wada illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam. That we associate to partner with him. Wala yattakhizabad dunabad dan arbaban min dunillah. That we erect not among ourselves lords and pits other than Allah. Fain tawallah. If then they turn back. Fakulu shadu. Say ibe witness. Be anna muslimoon. That we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ta'alo ila kalimatin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as been us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship man but Allah. The most important point while doing da'wah is come to common terms. And in coming to common terms, the most important of this point is Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship man but Allah. You may talk anything about Islam. Oh, Islam is very good. It has got so many benefits, so and so things, everything good about science technology fine but if you do not touch tawheed all your dawah is useless if you do not stop the shirk that is there in the lifestyle of the non-muslim all your dawah is useless you can speak about other things than science and technology and quran and all fine to get him to the main point of tawheed if you do not touch on tawheed allah na'buda illallah your dawah is useless and i've given the talk on concept of god in the major world religions and if you read the scriptures of the major world religions, all these major world religions, in the scriptures, it is mentioned about one God. It mentions that God is only one. It mentions he is not begotten. It's mentioned that he has got no idols. He alone should be worshipped. Whether it be Hindu scriptures, whether it be Christian scriptures, Jewish scriptures, Parsi scriptures, all these scriptures mention about one God. But, we Muslims, we have many excuses for not doing our job many muslims come and tell me but zakir our knowledge is very weak inshallah one day when we get enough knowledge we start doing dawa people want to wait till they want to become like sheikh ahmed didad and then they start doing dawa that time will never come our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it's mentioned in sahih bukhari volume number 4 hadith number 3461 propagate even if you know one verse about islam even if you know one verse about islam our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said you propagate it whatever you know properly as long as you know it correctly it's your duty you have to convey that message to the others every muslim at least he knows the shahada there's no god but allah and prophet muhammad peace be upon the messenger of allah at least go and tell your non-muslim friends that there is one allah there is one god if he asks you what is the proof if you don't know you come back and do your homework in this age of science and technology everything is on your fingertips you have got internet you have got dvds video cassettes, audio cassettes, books, literature, and I've given a talk on is the Quran God's word, where I've proved scientifically the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See that DVD, memorize it, go and give the answer. Now, you are the master of one answer. That there is one God, and you have proved it scientifically. Go and tell him, why don't you believe in last and final messenger? 
the non-Muslim will tell you that why should I believe in him? Don't know the answer, come back. I've given the talk and there's a book also available. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the world religious scriptures. He's mentioned my name, he's prophesied in the Jewish scriptures, Christian scriptures, Hindu scriptures, Parsi scriptures, Buddhist scriptures. Hear it? Memorize it? Go and give the answer. Now, you are the master of two answers. Continue. Why don't you offer Salah? Why I should offer? Come back and do your homework. I've given the talk on Salah, the program into righteousness. Slowly, slowly, you keep on gaining knowledge. Don't wait till you become like say, at least open your mouth. And the moment you open your mouth, Allah helps you. And the best example is the person standing in front of you. If you know my background, I was a stammerer from childhood. If you would have asked me, maybe 20 years back, what is the name? I said, my name is Azakir. Az 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 that was me. I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor or surgeon in the world. In your dreams, you can dream of anything. I could have dreamt of becoming the best surgeon in the world, but I could not have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. Mashallah, inspired by Sheikh Ahmad Didal, Balligwani Walawaya, and I started my Balligwani Walawaya. I haven't gone to Dalal room. I haven't gone to an Islamic school. Person from medical background started. But I realized when I started speaking to the Christian missionaries, the priests, the fathers, when I had to speak with them, my stammering used to vanish. When I had to speak with the Muslims, again I had to start stammering. And it went on. I came on the stage by default. It was my friend who got cold feet. I was forced to come. It clicked. And now, by Allah's grace, speaking an audience of tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands, largest audience is one million people live. <laughs> Just on the saying of Sheikh Ahmed Didad, who repeated the saying of a Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Balligo Anya Wala Aya. Propagate even even a one verse. What I heard from Sheikh Didad, one cassette, immediately I started. I didn't wait to see 100 cassettes. Started. And Alhamdulillah, the more you repeat, the more Allah gives you. I haven't gone to his alulum. And imagine now, mashallah, the audiences, live audiences, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, a million is the largest audience. On the satellite, 100 million people watching, mashallah. We never did this to get fame. We did it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who mashallah opens up the pathway. But we Muslims, we have many excuses. You know, many Muslims tell me that when we speak to the non-Muslims, they tell us that first go and improve your Muslims. First go and improve your Muslims. See what they are doing. Then come and speak to us. So because the Muslims ourselves are not good, they aren't pious. That's the reason we can't do dawah to the non-Muslims. Today, there are hundreds of thousands of Christian missionaries throughout the world. I ask the question. I ask my Muslim brothers, that do you know these Christian missionaries? You know they have alcohol? Yes, I know. Do you have alcohol? He said, no. Who's better, you or he? I am better. I ask the Muslims. Do these Christians, these Christian missionaries, many of them have drugs. Do you have drugs? He said, no. Who is better, he or you? I am better. No, many of these Christians, they do fornication, they do adultery. Do you do fornication? He said, no. Who is better, him or you? I. With all the defects, these Christian missionaries, with so many defects, yet they are spreading the word of Christianity. Hundreds of them, thousands of them, hundreds and thousands of them. They leave the country and they travel thousands of miles to spread the word of the Bible. Don't give excuse that first go and tell your Muslim brothers. And there are many Muslims who come and tell me, Brother Zakir, first, hum musalman ko pakka musalman banayenge, fir hum gair musalman ko dawa karenge. First we'll make the Muslims practicing Muslims, and after we make all the Muslims practicing Muslims, then we will go and convey the message to the non-Muslims. I tell them, 
This time will never come. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he himself could not convince his own relatives. Do you think you're better than the Prophet? How a Prophet, he could not convince his own uncle. Do you think you're better than the Prophet? It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, in the Book of Salah, volume number one, that the Prophet says that in Medina, there were Muslims who did not come to the mosque for the compulsory Salah. Talking about Juma Salah. The Prophet says, he felt like burning their homes. That means in Medina. There were Muslims who were not good practicing Muslims. Yet the Prophet, he sent messengers, he sent messages to the king of Yemen, to the king of Persia. He sent messages to the king of Byzantine. He did not say, first I'll make all the Muslims, 100% practicing Muslims, and then I'll convey the message to the non-Muslims. You have to do both simultaneously. When you meet a Muslim, fine, do Islam with him. When you meet a non-Muslim, do Dawa to him. Both are equally important, Dawa and Islam. But if no, 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 which is more important? Both are important. No, which is more important? I ask him the question. Suppose a patient of heart attack comes to a doctor, stroke. And a patient of common gold comes. And the doctor has limited time. Who should he treat? A person with heart attack or a person with common gold? Who? Heart attack. I am talking common gold, not swine flu. Huh? Even if swine flu comes, heart attack is more important. Swine flu. It is the media. Media hypo. That's another question we won't deal with now. So the person is the mushrik. He is doing shirk. If you don't convey the message, you will go to hell. The Muslim Islam is important. But more important is Zawa. Actually, both are important. If the doctor has time, you should treat both. The person with heart attack also with common cold. So when you meet a Muslim to Islam, when you meet a non-Muslim to Dawa, both are equally important. Do both. You can't say, I'll first make all the Muslim pakka Muslim and then do Dawa. That time will never come. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hajjatul Vida, in the last Qutbah he gave, in the last pilgrimage, there were about 110,000 Sahabas. He asked them, that did I deliver the message to you? And all of them said, Bay Shak, they bore witness that yes, you have delivered the message to us. Then the Prophet said, all those who are present here, go and deliver the message to those who are not present here. And do you know, out of this, out of 110,000 Sahabas, more than 90,000 Sahabas are buried outside Arabia. Doing what? Making Muslim pakka Muslim, making a Muslim more pious Muslim. They were buried outside Arabia, doing da'wah to the non-Muslims. More than 80% of the Sahabas, they went outside following the commandment of the Prophet, doing da'wah to the non-Muslims. There are many Muslims that have excuses. They say that when we speak to the non-Muslims, they tell me that mind your own business. I tell them, if some non-Muslim tells me that mind your own business, I will tell him, that's what I'm doing. It's my business. It is the business of every Muslim to mind other people's business as far as Dawah is concerned. It is the business of every Muslim to mind other person's business as far as removing shirk is concerned. So that's what I'm doing. When someone says mind your own business, that's what I'm doing. This is my business. It's the business of every Muslim to be a dai. At least a part-time dai, if not a full-time dai. I'll give you an example. Suppose if you're going on a hill station, along with the family, and you have two kids, a girl and a boy, and your boy, Ahmed, four years old, while you're talking to your wife, and your small kid, Ahmed, four years old, he slips away from you, and is going towards the edge of the cliff. Now, by the time you realize that he's missing, he's already gone far away. And then you see him that walking close to the edge of the cliff. You want to shout, Ahmad, be careful, you'll fall down. But your voice cannot reach him, far away. There you see an elderly gentleman at the edge of the cliff with his hand folded. He's admiring beauty. You want to shout, Mister, Bhai Sahib, save my son, he will die. But your voice cannot reach him. This elderly gentleman, he looks at your son, he smiles at your son, then continues admiring beauty. Your son is coming closer to the edge of the cliff. This man again smiles at him and admires beauty. 
next step he takes is over the cliff and he falls and he dies i am asking the question will you or will you not blame that elderly gentleman for not saving your son will you or will you not only thing he had to do was stretch his hand he didn't even have to take a step forward only thing he had to do was stretch his hand and your son would have been saved will you blame him or not yes or no yes but when you tell him why didn't you save my son he will say i was minding my own business he's right he didn't push your son did he did he ask your son to jump no why did you be blamed did he push him no did he ask him to jump no but yet you will say he at least had wisdom god gave him wisdom my son 4 years old masoom innocent what does he know yet you will blame him will you or will you not of course same way on the day of judgment these mushriks these non muslims on the day of judgment they will blame the muslims they will catch your collar that when allah subhanahu wa taala when almighty god gave you hidayah why didn't you tell us on the day of judgment these non muslims will blame the muslims and tell that why didn't these muslims who allah gave hidayah to who allah gave guidance to why didn't they correct us it is the duty of every muslim that he conveys the message of islam to the non muslims suppose if you have a neighbor who's a mushrik and if you have not conveyed the message of islam to him and if he dies allah will ask him on the day of judgment why didn't you accept islam he will say ya allah bari taala no one gave me the message he said i gave the message directly to you you did shirk you'll go to hell allah will ask you next did you convey the message to your neighbor non muslim neighbor and if you say no you will follow him you will follow him it's the duty of every muslim that he should convey the message of allah subhanahu wa taala to those who are not aware of it but we muslims we have many excuses we have many excuses for not doing the job many of the muslims tell me you know but allah says in the quran lakum deenukum wal yadeen the quran says lakum deenukum wal yadeen no to you is your way to me is mine so why should we do dawa what they quoting is the verse of the quran from surah kafirun chapter number 109 verse number 6 what they quoting is the last verse of surah kafirun it is out of context if you really want to quote surah kafirun quote in context from verse number 1 surah kafirun chapter number 109 verse number 1 to 6 qul ya ayyuhal kafirun la abdu ma ta'budun wa la antum abduna ma abud wa la ana abdun ma abadtum wa la antum abduna ma abud lakum dinukum wal yadin say to those who reject faith i will not worship that which you worship nor will you worship what i worship i will not worship what you want me to worship nor will you worship what i worship to use your way to me is mine after you have delivered the message of islam and then if he does not accept it then you can say that i will not worship what you worship you will not worship what i worship to use your way to me is mine unless you have not delivered the message of islam to the non muslim you cannot say lakum deenukum wal yadin Muslims tell me, but doesn't Allah say like Allah has deen? There's no compulsion in religion. Again, out of context. What the quoting is the words of Quran from Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number two fifty six. It does say like Allah has deen. There's no compulsion in religion, but it continues. But truth stands out clear from error. And if you reject the evil one and believe in Allah, you have grasped the most strongest handhold, which will never break. When you say like Rafidin, there is no compulsion in religion. You also have to say through stands of clear from error. You convey the truth to them. You can't force anyone to accept Islam. You can't force anyone to accept the Quran or accept Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. You can't put a gun on his forehead. You can't take a sword. It's not allowed. But at least you convey the message. You can't force agree, but at least convey. Tell them through stands of clear from error. So unless you have not conveyed the message, you cannot say lakum dino kum waliyad din. After conveying the message, you can say like Rafid din. There is no compulsion in religion. You can't force anyone, but at least convey the message. 
It's the duty of every Muslim to at least be a part-time dai. It's a fard. It's the duty of every Muslim to at least be a part-time dai. Dawa is a fard for every Muslim. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, Wal Asr. Inna al insana la fikhus. Illa ladina aminu. Wa aminu salihati. Wa tawasaw bil haqq. Wa tawasaw bil sabr. That by the token of time, Allah is taking the promise that human beings are in khasara, they are in loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. For any human being to go to Jannah, minimum four criteria are required. Iman, righteous deeds, exhorting people to truth, that is doing dawah, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these four criteria is missing, you shall not enter Jannah. You may be a very good Muslim, you may be offering five times Salah, you may be fasting in the month of Ramadan, you may have performed Hajj, but if you don't do Dawa, you shall not enter Jannah according to Surah Al Asr. If Allah wants to forgive you and put you in Jannah, it is Allah's prerogative. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 48, and Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 116, that if Allah pleases, He may forgive any sin, but the sin of shirk He will not forgive. Because a person who commits shirk has strayed away far. So if Allah wants to forgive you and put you in Jannah, it is Allah's prerogative. But under normal circumstances, according to Surah Al-Asr, if you don't do Dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. Only Dawah is also not sufficient. All four are equally important. Iman, righteous deed, Watawa Sobil Haq, that is Dawah and Islah, Watawa Sobil Sabr, inviting people to patience and perseverance. So it's compulsory that every Muslim should at least be a part-time Dai. You don't have to be a full-time Dai like Shaykh Didar or a full-time Dai like me. At least be a part-time Dai, it's a fard. Allah also says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 104, one of the verses which the Qari, Farik, he recited, which says, Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 104, that let there arise out of you a band of people who are inviting towards good, Enjoying what is right and forbidding what is wrong. Allah is talking about full-time dais. How you are full-time doctors, full-time engineers, full-time lawyers, full-time businessmen. How many full-time dais do you have? How many dais do you have which travel to different parts of the world and convey the message? You can count them on your fingertips. Allah says in the Quran that let there arise out of you a band of people, dais who are inviting people to the good, enjoying what is right and forbidding what is wrong, these are the ones that shall attain felicity. I mean, these are the ones that will attain a higher grade in Jannah. Allah says, here Allah is talking full-time dais. There is no better profession than a profession of a dai. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahl, chapter number 16, verse number 125, that invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. I would like to end this talk by giving the message which is repeated in the Quran in no less than three different places. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, Chapter number 9, verse number 33. In Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9. And Surah Fatah, chapter 48, verse number 28, Allah says, Huwa allazi arsala rasoolahu bil huda wa deen al-haq liyu zira wa ala deen kulli alaw qayl al-mushikoon. That Allah has sent His messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, all the other isms, whether it be Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Atheism, Secularism, Modernism, Islam is destined to supersede all. Kulli, master them all. How much the Mushrik don't like it? How much the idol worshippers don't like it? Allah mentioned this twice in Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse 33 and Surah Saf chapter 16 verse number 9. And the third time in Surah Fatah chapter 48 verse number 28, Allah repeats the message a different ending. Allah says, that Allah sent his messenger 
with guidance. He has sent the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with guidance and the religion of truth, so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other isms, whether it be Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Parsiism, Sikhism, Atheism, Modernism, Secularism. Islam is destined to supersede all, Kulli, master them all. Bakafa billahi shayda. And enough is Allah as a witness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. Allah does not require you and me to make his deen prevail. If we think that if we don't do dawah, Islam would not spread. If I start thinking that if I don't do dawah, Islam would not spread, I am the biggest fool in the world. Allah does not require you and me to make his deen prevail. The rubbish that we are. Allah doesn't require you and me. Allah is sufficient to make his deen prevail. Allah is giving us an opportunity to make hay while the sun is shining. Allah has promised his deen will prevail. Whether you and I do da'wah or not, Islam is bound to prevail. Allah is giving you an opportunity to do a prophet's job and to earn a prophet's reward. I like to end the talk with the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33 which changed me from a doctor of a body to a doctor of soul. When I found I became a medical doctor because I thought it was the best profession in the world. It is a good profession. But when I found a better profession, the profession of a dai, I changed my profession from a doctor of a body to a doctor of soul. I will end the talk with the verse of the Quran of Surah Fusilah, chapter number 41, verse number 33, where Allah says that, وَمَنْ أَحَسُنُ قَالَ مِمَّنْ دَعِلَ اللَّهِ وَأَمِلَ صَالِحَوْنَ قَالَ إِنِّي مِنْ مُسْلِمِينَ that who is better in speech than one who invites people to the way of the Lord, works righteousness and says that I am a Muslim.